You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Super excited to introduce a new friend that I met just a couple months ago to our audience. Ivan, please go ahead and get us started. Hi, I'm Ivan Zach. Uh, very excited to introduce a sort of legendary person, uh, Dr. Douglas Asperus. Douglas is a chief veterinary officer at Veterinary Practice Partners. He has been a clinician and owner of several AHA accredited companion animal hospitals in the New York City metro area and started and managed an ER. He currently chairs the Veterinary Innovation Council and the NYS Board of Veterinary Medicine. In the past, he has served on the Council of Education, the National Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners, the AVMA Board of Directors, and a trustee of the AVMA PLIT. He was elected to serve as a president of AVMA from 2012 to 2013. Wow, what a, uh, what a pleasure to have you here and thank you for finding the time. Great. I think it's, uh, it's, I'm excited to, uh, to be on the podcast. As a short-term listener, uh, you guys are doing, uh, doing a great job. So, Doug, th- this is quite a resume. And before we jump into any particulars, can you just, you know, as someone that continuously pivots uh, himself, so I, I you know, I, I'm a vet myself, and then I build the software, and then I work for IDEX. And I just want to hear, how did you get on this path? Because so many people in our industry are burned out. And I think that people that pivot and find new uh, avenues with the background, then they, they're just happier. So are you happy today? And and uh, what was guiding your, your path and your career? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a happy person. Um, yeah, so th- I think there are a couple of, um, couple of issues in there. You know, one is that you have to take charge of your own career and your life. And for me, I get bored easily. I want to do something new. I want to be involved in something different. And I'm willing to say yes when people ask for volunteers because you just never know where that's going to take you. And I do think that, um, or I thought early on, um, you could probably start with my clinical career. I never really expected to be a clinician. Uh, I graduated from vet school after having spent zero days in veterinary practices. Uh, I'd never worked in a veterinary practice. I never had any pets that I brought to a veterinary practice. Uh, I really expected that I would do research uh, because I worked for USDA all through school and then decided I needed to get out of Ithaca, New York, and it's gray, gray, gray winters and uh, and got into clinical practice and turned out that was terrific. Um, Something new every day, unpredictable. Uh, people uh, really both allowing us to do the things I wanted to do, but also really being thankful for what we did for their pets. And, and it was so different from, from research, which, you know, you work for something for two years and, and then a year later, there's a publication and probably nobody ever read it. And, and you think, wow, that was great. You know, there's like no strokes and you get into clinical practice and you get strokes I thought all the time. And I know that's not exactly what uh, veterinarians these days are thinking about or how they're realizing or, or seeing their careers. But for me, I thought it was, I thought it was terrific. But it also was limiting. You know, at some point in your career, um, you kind of know what you're going to do. I mean, it makes you a really good clinician, uh, lets you focus on clients, which clients really want you focused on them, because you don't have to think that much about the medicine. You kind of know what you're going to do. And at that point, I really wanted to branch out and find other things to do. Um, and so if you keep your head up and, and look around, opportunities come up, I think, all the time. And so that's that's really been the story of my career. Yeah, I like that idea of just saying yes and kind of getting out of the way and seeing what, what might happen. Pretty interesting. So I've got a question for you. So the Veterinary Innovation Council. So we're in this industry. Me and I love it. We love all of the innovation that's happening inside the veterinary domain. And a lot of people think that there's none happening. What is the Veterinary Innovation Council and, and how have you been you know, a functional part of that organization? So the, the Innovation Council came up, um, really was the, the brainchild of um, Tom Bond at, uh, at NAVC and the NAVC board. And I think the, the nexus of it was 
that we are we are a very conservative uh, profession. And honestly, I I personally think that all professions are pretty conservative. You know, to be a professional, you kind of front load the investment in your career, and then you don't want surprises. I mean, who wants surprises, right? If you've just spent eight years and a whole lot of money to get trained and to to enter a career, you don't want the drug pulled out from under you and, and find out that that what you thought you were going to get is not what you're going to get. And yet we, you know, involve, we, we exist in a world that is constantly innovating, finding different ways, new ways to provide services, cheaper ways, um, more easier to access ways to, to get what you want or what you need. And if you have a, a profession that is, is just throwing out anchors to, to stop that change, um, we were going to get run over. And so the, the question was, how do we get uh, in front of the profession issues that the profession really needs to think about? Because we don't get to control our own futures. You know, the, both our, our clients and the society around us gets to control our futures more than we think. And uh, if we want to if we want to play a role in that future and uh, and help control it because we care about the profession and we care about what we do and, and uh, the clients we serve and the patients we treat, then we need to be on board. And so that was the really the, the start of the, the Veterinary Innovation Council is stuff's happening. Let's get in front of it uh, and be part of the conversation. So so what does Veterinary Innovation Council do and how do you guys contributing to the profession? Because, you know, I've been in uh, change management in the veterinary domain for the last well, at least probably eight to 10 years. And uh, that's probably the hardest thing to do because that follows immediately after an unwillingness to change. The change management is hard. So uh, what is it that Innovation Council do and uh, what our listeners could learn to kind of, you know, change a little bit of a perspective that we have? So it's interesting. You know, one of the things that uh, was pretty clear to us early on uh, as we started to, you know, get our hands around, you know, what our unique value proposition was for the VIC, uh, was that we were not going to, one, actually change the world. We didn't have the resources to change the world. And we didn't think that we actually had a directionality that we needed to bring to the profession either. And to say, here's how you should change, and here's the direction you should change, and how this is the process for doing that. We wanted to bring to um, everybody's plate, kind of the, the list of things that that were already bearing down on us. And you guys are keeping your head in the, stand, the sand. Stuff is happening and let's let's embrace it. And we started with we started with telemedicine and and virtual care because telemedicine was everybody was knocking on the door, uh, not on not just on the human side, but on the veterinary side. Uh, and the veterinary profession was you know, had dug their heels in and said, nope, not going to happen. And, uh, and if, if it does happen, it's going to be over our, our dead bodies and not, uh, we were not going to play a role in it. And I think we were quite effective at pushing a lot of people in the profession to start thinking about it otherwise, uh, start to recognize that, that uh, the tools were going to be out there, whether we liked them or not, uh, that, uh, at least to, to some extent, our clients would want them. Uh, and uh, we need to be, again, in the conversation. We need to be, if not in the driver's seat, at least, you know, in the car. And so that, to me, that that set the, the template for how we uh, engaged uh, the profession. Uh, again, not making the change, but pulling together people to address the changes that were already happening around them, or at least incipiently happening around them in order to to take some some control uh and not be not be passive that's you know that that's a hot topic and it has been and 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 i you know admittedly in many podcasts i talk about the fact that i'm tired with this topic in veterinary domain because this is like fourth how many vis uh, summits they were from the very first one, I was excited in the first one. Everybody's talking telemedicine, innovative, and all of this. And then the second one, everybody's still talking about it. And third one is everybody's still talking about it. And then pandemic didn't really make veterinarians to change into teleconsulting and telemedicine. I'm like, 
what else if not the global pandemic situation can convince vets to use it so from your perspective you, you know you've been with a very large group uh with a vpp and uh and then you you see the uh, single veterinary hospitals is there a different approach these days because i know many groups that when pandemic hit us they went we're changing to telemedicine and then three weeks later we changed to telemedicine what's your revenue 250 dollars uh, so is it systemically changed? Because what I've seen is that everybody bought, you know, some sort of platform, but you can't buy a hammer and wait for the house to be built. You really need to change the workflows. You need to align with people. You need to insert change management and then understand how does it work full cycle from initiating appointments, seeing the client, prescribing diagnostics, interpreting them, and then prescribing medication and monitoring compliance. So do you know any successful groups? Do you know any successful individual hospitals that actually took the full cycle and implemented it? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's, no. That, was, that was an easy question. <laughs> Honestly, I totally agree with you. When, when in, in the months before coronavirus really got, got its little fingers on us, uh, we had met uh, myself and, and a couple of uh, VPP um, uh, leaders with all of the telemedicine groups, platforms that were out there at BMX in uh, 2019, and we just could not convince ourselves it was a business case for telemedicine for us. And I, and I think, if nothing else, the pandemic kind of put an exclamation point on that, because it is hard to come up with a business case for telemedicine that was going to deliver value uh, and be integrated into anybody's workflow, at least unless you had a really, really large platform uh, and you could have a, a dedicated group of people who would actually just handle, you know, phone calls. But none of us really like that. I mean, how much? How many of us like doing the chats when we're on on somebody's um, website? I mean, I'd rather either talk to somebody or or click on a form. But I don't want to do a chat with somebody who was chatting to six other people, and most of the time I don't know whether they're a chat bot or a person anyway. And we've all been doing telemedicine for at least all of my career, right? We uh, used telemedicine as triage and as uh, marketing. Uh, and to me, those two things are really the biggest value that telemedicine provides. And I think you have to, you have to differentiate between reality and uh, futurists. Uh, I, I personally uh, never really understand what futurists know that I don't know uh, and uh, and if they make predictions, nobody holds their feet to the fire anyway. And so the idea that that millennials just want to uh, they just want to talk to their phone, and uh, in fact they'd rather text than talk to their phone, and that's how my your pets are going to get care. Those two things don't quite align for me because I'm a big believer. Um, if you've never been through the the Frank Clinical Communication Program or understand. Cambridge Calgary or Calgary Cambridge model of clinical communications, like the most important thing uh, that doctors can do is engender trust. And that's really hard to do virtually. Uh, you know, we're still a social species. Otherwise, we wouldn't use Zoom and look at each other because we want to look at one another because we get all of these, these uh, communication uh, pieces from, from looking at people and being with people and hearing people. And so, uh, you know, I, I think most of us want a doctor, if we're actually worried, if there's actually something going on, we want a person that we trust to help guide us through whatever decisions we have to make. And I think that's, you know, one of those places where I, I think it's really, really difficult to have virtual care replace veterinarians. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating and makes a ton of sense. I love your futurist comments. Those guys get off really easy. They just get to come up with the big ideas, right? So, Doug, from someone at your vantage point, you know, being involved in the Veterinary Innovation Council, being part of a large group, running your own practice, still in the profession, what really excites you about veterinary medicine these days? So I'm excited as always, and it gets tri feels trite to say, but I'm excited about the animals. I mean, I really still love the animals. Um, you know, what makes veterinary medicine different from, from other, other sciences? I mean, I really love math. I really love physics. I was probably a better physics student at Cornell as an undergraduate than I was a biology student, but, but the animalness of, of veterinary medicine is, is really appealing. 
Um, and it's what appeals to, it's why there is a veterinary profession. People really care about animals. Um, they care about them in, uh, in, in sort of virtual ways. They care about animals that you know, live across the globe. Um, animals are endangered as much as they care about the animal that's sitting in their lap. Um, they care about farm animals. They care about the animals they eat. And, uh, and, and I think that is really what makes veterinary medicine special, um, is why people are so connected to us and why they respect us as much as we, they do. And to me, that's, you know, I, I washed my dog this morning um, <laughs> just because she smelled and she's small enough to fit in the, in the sink, so she's fast. It's just, I still love all of that. Part B to the question is from a technology and innovation perspective, what excites you? So there is a lot of opportunity out there for us to do a better job uh, with our patients, uh, with our clients. And some of them are, 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 are human and some of them are technological. And, and I, I don't think it's all technology. I mean, technology allows you to be more efficient but it doesn't get you off the hook for doing all of the other stuff that you need to do as a human being, as a human doctor. And um, yeah, so I'm excited about the potential for us to finally get as a profession efficient. Uh, if there's nothing uh, else right now that I think is really demanding uh, of us in the profession is to get more efficient. Uh, we've spent I don't know. I mean, it feels like my whole career, maybe the past 30 years, solving our problems by raising prices. And we just can't keep doing that. Um, you know, one of the things that the Veterinary Innovation Council is focused on right now is access to care. And access to care, um, while there are many different dimensions of access to care, almost all of them, one way or another, uh, resolve to financial issues. Uh, and whether those financials issues are around personal wealth or income, or whether that's, you know, the community you live in, um, not supporting um, uh, access to, to care, whether that's, you know, not being able to, you know, take a bus with your dog in order to uh, access care, for any of those things, finances matter. And we become more and more and more uh, dependent on a smaller group of pet owners that can afford you know, TPLOs, uh, I'm going to go down the list. Uh, it's great that we can do such amazing things with cancer patients, for instance. But, you know, the, most Americans can't come up with $400 uh, tomorrow if they had to come up with something, you know, right away. And people who can't come up with $400 tomorrow can't afford $10,000 for extending, you know, their pet's life for another three months. And yet, as a profession, we are very glad to, pleased with ourselves, to provide care for the people that can afford that $10,000 to extend their, their pet's life. And while that's a great thing, there's a whole lot of you know, patients who get no care. And so if we're going to expand that access to care to all of those other animals, if we really think we have value to, uh, to provide, we're going to have to get to be more efficient in the way we uh, deliver care. And so uh, to me, that's, that's the technology, you know, there's technology that can help us, but, but there's systems that we need to fix. I had an, I had a conversation two days ago with, uh, it was fascinating. Uh, and it's, it's in the last month, second conversation that I had with someone who provides care without caring of cost. So one of them, it's an emergency hospital in Dallas. And then the, the management there said, we're going to be zero economic euthanasia emergency hospital, which I worked in emergency my entire career, and that's a nonsense if you bring up something like that to management. And they actually managed to do that. And they said, you know, a block cat, you know, may, may cost to the client two and a half thousand dollars. But if I use a tech on block, suture the catheter in and put them on fluids, it actually is 40 bucks in cost to us. So if we save that pet, then that's worth to us emotional you know, what we bring to the team and how we operate here. And then another one yesterday or two days ago was very interesting. It's a clinician in Colorado. He built his entire business and 20 years of practice by building a foster clinic right next to his actual clinic. And then the foster home network around his hospital and miles and miles away that 
was created in the last 15 years. He will treat, uh, he told us about this case with a bilateral entropion and completely bald dog from Scabies. He treated that, he said, I maybe spent hundred bucks on that in my own time. But then the dog was adopted by someone in the neighborhood and they have three more dogs and they came in with all of their dogs to him. So I looked at it, I was like, that's, if you look at it as our actual expense, not what it would cost if they paid, and then if you look at it at almost like that's your customer acquisition cost, I just spent hundred bucks to get three more pets that a lifetime value of that patient is $13,000. All of a sudden I just created $60,000 of business by providing free care for a hundred bucks. So if we start looking at that through that lens, I mean, it becomes very interesting if this is a scalable model. So I was just, you know, I was fascinated with those two stories. But the question that I have now for you, Doug, what do you think about these wellness plans and membership models? Are they an instrument to provide more care or they're an instrument to grab more money from the client? <laughs> well, I mean, it could be both. No, I, I think the the idea of, of uh, allowing people to or, or offering ways to spread the cost over the course course of the year makes sense, right? You don't need to face a decision between care and no care because, again, you can't come up with $400 today. If you could save up $400 over the course of the year, then when the problem occurs, you can still manage it. Um, so I do think that that kind of payment plan has value, but you have to figure out how to balance the cost over the, the value. And I think that becomes the, the challenge for for all of that. I think it's one of the biggest problems uh, or challenges right now for pet health insurance is how do you how do you make it make sense uh, for people who otherwise couldn't afford care without was tailoring it for people who can afford care and can also afford a big ticket for for insurance. And I think that's one of the reasons that we still have such low um, uh, use of, of pet health insurance in the U.S. because we haven't really figured that out. Oh, man, I, I wish we had an hour more because we're out of time, like every other week. Doug, it was a fascinating conversation. Truly a pleasure to stretch out our conversation that started at VIS over the course of the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Before we let you go, we have two questions for you. First one is another innovator that you think we should have come on this show that's in the veterinary space. Just today, tomorrow, the next day, uh, uh, ABMA is doing its uh, economic forum. And a uh, classmate and friend of mine, Ken Rotundo, if you've never met Ken, uh, is going to be talking about uh, how we could understand our clients better and, and offer the services that they're wanting. So Ken is always always worthwhile talking to. Smart, erudite, and, and uh, experienced. Yeah, so he would be on my list. And the second question that we ask, uh, is there a book or TED Talk or um, or anything that inspired you recently that you would recommend to our listeners? Oh, God, you shouldn't ask me these kinds of questions because um, I'm such a contrarian about this. So one, I hate TED Talks. TED Talks, everybody sounds like they're so good and and they hire coaches and they've spent, you know, weeks doing this. It's kind of like George Carlin would you know, do his, uh, his <laughs> bit. he would practice, you know, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to do it. So Ted talks, no, tooth the seal, even though Out of some question. Of them okay. good parts. It, it can be a paperback management books. No, <laughs> I have not been, I've never read a management book that did not encapsulate the entire book in the forward. Um, so if you have one for which that's not true, for which that there's actually value into reading the whole book, let me know. <laughs> that's interesting. And that's going to shorten my course in Stanford right now. I'm going to just do that. <laughs> if you're writing one, don't write a forward because forward is the whole show. Yeah. So you asked me uh, beforehand, you know, do I have a, a book to recommend? And I always recommend Pale Fire, Nabokov's, one of the best books of the 20th century. Funny, interesting. It's just an amazing, amazing book. So, thank you so much for listening to the veterinary innovation podcast if you want to hear about our new episodes please follow us on any social media channel also you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com see you next week